buddy. That's as much a shock to me as it is to you. Um, <clears throat> Janie called me this morning and I uh, started thinking, what, what can I, what can I say? Brother Lumen's kind of under the weather and stoved up <laughs> pretty bad. Uh, so, uh, keep him in your prayers. But, uh, there's a couple of things that I've been kind of looking at in the last little while and I thought, well... I'll either deal with the one where we go through a bunch of scriptures, or deal with the one we probably won't, and uh, just share something that's kind of a burden on my own heart for a while in my mind, and just something I think about quite often with myself. It's very easy, seemingly. All of us seem to say we're Christ-centered. And we hold that moniker, Christ-centered teaching, Christ-centered. But I begin to really consider what that means. And in the light of that, I was kind of looking at different people in different uh, theological circles that use that phrase. And one of the phrases they use is Christocentric. Theology, they'll use Christocentric soteriology, which means a Christ centered salvation or understanding of salvation. And so I want to adopt that just for a little while and go over these things with you. Just something, just I wrote down a couple of pages of things that have been on my mind. It's nothing that we probably hadn't considered or thought of before. But then I want to di- draw a diagram that I think helps, it helped me uh, look at things from a truly Christ centered perspective when it comes to salvation. And there is a great necessity for us not to just say we're Christ centered, but to truly be Christ centered. What does that mean? What does it mean? It doesn't just mean Jesus is a very important part of this. No, it means he's all of it, or he's none of it. And that scares us. <laughs> that scares Christians to say that because it's almost like we're taking away our responsibility out of that picture. Because we love to have that personal responsibility, and then we hate it when we can't live up to it, and we never seem to be able to. And it's just a vicious, vicious cycle. And I wear that when we talk about a Christ-centered salvation, that's huge, and there's just not a lot you can do to even put a dent in it in this session today. But I do want to take a shot at at least looking at the necessity of it and showing, I think, the, the symptoms in the church today or not really putting my finger on that, but just seeing that there are some truly terrible symptoms of having the opposite of a Christ center. There's these two, and I'm going to clarify what I say as I go, but there's two ways that men look at salvation seemingly. There's a Christ-centered salvation, and then there's a man-centered salvation, and we seem to confuse the two. We get the two really confused. We (laughs) go, you got to come in, I got you. Uh, (laughs) But there's those two ways of looking at things. And let me just say at the beginning, that, uh, well, we've already talked about Israel and there's no hope for him. Uh, But uh, anyway, uh, on the top of it, let me just say this. When I use the word during this session, I'm going to use the word view and perspective and all of that. And it's just to kind of help say the words and say it in a way. But we need to understand when I use, like, what is our perspective, what is our view of salvation, Let me just say this. There's only one of these options that's actually real when it comes to salvation. Only one. And it's Christ-centered. It's Christ all. It's Christ in you. There is no such thing as man-centered salvation. That's not a real thing. That's just how I approach it. 
in my own theology and understanding. So let me just say, our view of it takes nothing away from the fact that when we were born again, we had Christ in all of his fullness gifted to the soul. And this is kind of what I want to talk about, how the... I, uh, I wrote a book called Knowing the Satisfied God. I have a podcast called The Satisfied God Podcast. This has been a big theme for a long time with me. And so everything with me now seems to go through that filter ever since the Lord dealt with me about the fact that our salvation is a gift given to our soul from a God who is satisfied. Unless we have that as the basis of our salvation... Unless we understand that that's the starting point, we're going to think that's the goal, to satisfy God who's always ticked off, who's always angry, or whose eyes is always gazing upon me or you to try to find what he's after. When we understand that God had what he was after before he could ever gift it to my soul, then there's rest. There's the true Sabbath that we come into where God rested from all of his works and said, it is very good. There's who we receive. That's who we receive. That's the reality of a Sabbath we enter into when we come through the door. And when that's the basis and the origination of the soul salvation, then it will not be assumed, falsely assumed, to be the goal for which we are on this journey to one day have God nod at us and say, you did it. No, he did it. And we are beneficiaries of what he has done. We are vessels of mercy, and that's an important thing. We are vessels who who necessitated the mercy of God to be extended to us for anything to be ours. Any divine reality to be our portion. He had to do it. He had to interject himself or impose himself upon that situation. And thank God he did. But the problem is, when we have the teachings that we do today, man-centered, calling it Christ-centered, but man-centered indeed, then we'll get everything mixed around and think that the satisfaction of God is the thing he's looking at us for. That God's hope is all tied up to how I handle this, what I do with it. And if God is that foolish, He deserves what he gets. And that's not much. Not for me. Or you. God is not that foolish. He concluded the matter before he allowed me to enter into it. That's the beauty of this. And what then, again, I rip away the responsibility from the Christian. No, I take... I sh- I, I'm, I'm trying. I'm seeing salvation from an eternal perspective, and showing how we add nothing, nor can we ever take away from it. We are the recipients of a gift, a true gift, a true gift that beckons the soul that has received such a gift to come and know, come and see, grow in this grace that has been fully bestowed. So when we talk about a Christ-centered salvation. Versus a man-centered salvation. I want to talk about that for a little while. We're not going to get into a lot of stuff, but just hopefully, when I'm saying the things I'm saying, verses will come to your mind. You'll 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 be able to see where we're going in this, and even maybe spark a study of your own. Um, because the view of salvation that we truly have as Christians, our view, our perspective, although it doesn't take away from the truth of our salvation doesn't take away from the absoluteness of having Christ as our life and and all that that is. It will influence and govern our interpretation of scripture. It will influence our hermeneutic and our way of seeing the scriptures and what it says. So it will either be a declaration of Christ in every syllable of every word having us nowhere in it as far as a determining factor, or it will be prescriptions for us to apply to ourselves to get to where God wants us to be. 
That's not what the scripture's for. They are they that testify of me. You'll read, you'll read in Hebrews, and this is a big part of this, as far as God's will, intention, being summarized in Christ ever, before we're ever brought into the picture. Lo, I come. In the volume of the book, there's the volume of the book. It is written of me to what? Do thy will. Either he did it or it's left up to us. God doesn't have two, three, four, five dozen wills. He has one. And Christ came to do it. That means to accomplish it fully, to do his will. And then in Hebrews, it goes on after that and says, and by that offering, by that sacrifice, we who are saved are made perfect or sanctified through it. But it had to be done first. It had to be completed in the person who is his pleasure. In Hebrews 10, it keeps saying, in these things you had no pleasure. You had no pleasure in these offerings, in these sacrifices. So, no man that approached it could be truly purged of their sin and walk away with a, with a conscience that's free of sin because you had no pleasure yet. See how those things are tied together? God getting his pleasure First is the only real divine basis for us to ever have true rest. Because he has to have his first. He has to be at rest before he's able, out of the abundance of his wealth, to gift my soul with it. That's, I don't know, this has just become so big in me, I can't say it the way I want to, but. It's just beautiful. So we understand our hope that when we come into Christ, we come into a fellowship, a relationship with a satisfied God. And we're not the object of it. You realize he said that to one and he'll never say it to another. In you I am well pleased. He's only said it to one son and he never will say it to another. And most Christians are waiting on that day. And trying their best to, to, to be worthy of such a statement toward them. The fact is that statement has already been made unto your soul. When the one unto whom he says it came to reside in it. There's the pleasure of God realized. It's not realized by us. It's realized in us through the presence of Christ. It's like Hebrew or Romans 8 says very plainly, it is not the righteousness of the law fulfilled by us. It is now by the spirit dwelling in us, the righteousness of the law fulfilled in us by the presence of another, not in ourselves, not by our works or efforts. And so, you know, we're getting into something of this Christocentric view, I guess, when you look at something like that. And I, when I was looking at this, and there are those who would use this phrase, Christocentric salvation or soteriology. It's not a new word. It's been around forever, but, or a phrase. But they use it most of the time to debate or to prove what they call a limited atonement. Or it is tied very closely to what we call predestination. What is the debate of predestination, limited atonement? And I'm not going to get in that debate. I don't think either side of that debate is correct. They're both in error because neither are Christ-centered at all. Why? Because we, we have debated predestination, limited atonement, all of these centuries. It has always been focused on the man, men. Who is chosen? Who is elect? Who is to be saved and who is to not be saved? And it's always about men. How many, how much, who, and how many. That's always the way it is, right? So it's not Christ-centered whatsoever. Now, I do believe in a limited atonement. But my limitation is not who or how many. My limitation, the way I see atonement, is where and in whom. There's the only limitation. It is in him and nowhere else. That is the whole reality of predestination. God aforetime before pre determined the place where he would know and relate to all. But he will not relate to any outside of that predestined predetermined place. That's 
predestination. It's not about who is called, it's about to whom we have been called. There's the whole argument. And so when we talk about a, they talk about a Christocentric salvation, that's, that's a big part of their argument. But a Christocentric theology or salvation, to me, is basically defined this way, because I want us to just get something of a definition of this. In my mind, it's, it's defined this way. God having, possessing, and enjoying his satisfaction in its totality in his beloved son. And in that son alone, being glorified and receiving his eternal purpose fulfilled. And the salvation is, that's his gift to us. What we call salvation, he calls his satisfaction. He calls his relationship with his son. That's what we call satisfaction or salvation. Uh, and again, it has to be concluded in Christ before we receive. This is not a work in progress as people have taught. It's not a progressive thing where God is always getting what he's after. That's the root of dispensationalism. One day he'll have it. He started it here in Jesus on the cross. One day Jesus finally finished this thing. That's the same concept, but yet we take it out of Jesus and put it into us. In kind of a microfilm of the thing. We, we look at ourselves as a real important requirement in this picture. And we're not. We're not. We are recipients of reality. And that's, that's the beauty of it. We're recipients of reality. We're not those who make it happen. We're not those who make it real. We're not, it's not real depending on how we handle it. It's real whether we handle it or not. See, that seems weird. It seems like it just flies in the face of everything. But it's the truth. Because our handling of it makes no difference as to the truth of it. Our handling of it makes a lot of difference with our enjoyment of it, yes. What we do, yes. We're trying to put upon ourselves, or let's say it this way, we're trying to place God's expectation on us when God's expectation has always been upon his son and nowhere else. So, to me, seeing this settled in Christ puts it upon a heavenly, eternal foundation upon his own glory being realized, his own satisfaction being fulfilled. And God offers to man that satisfaction, that purpose, that will, fulfilled as a gift. I wrote here, this is the vital part of the distinction between these two views and why it is necessary we possess a Christ-centered understanding regarding salvation, because even the word when we say our salvation. Work out your own salvation, your salvation. That can either be a true burden, a weight upon the shoulders, and that's what most people have. Or it can be a true, wonderful point of gratitude and thanksgiving to a God that has done such a work. That has shared with a soul that which that soul had no hope of. That which our soul had no hope of at all. Something sure, something fixed. Something that is his pleasure. Something fully possessed by him. Now, there's a diagram here I want to draw. And maybe this will help. I don't know. Maybe it won't. Um, I have here God. I can't draw on a board very good. Or paper. God satisfied. This is, and we can look at this as 
beyond the cross, since the cross, the finished work, all of that, if you want. I think it goes way before that, before the foundation of the world even, but uh, if it makes you feel better, we will start this at death, burial, and resurrection being accomplished, God raising his son. And now God is satisfied. We read in the prophets where he will see the suffering of his seed and he will be satisfied. That is a beautiful statement concerning God satisfied. Here's the basis of it. He has in this son completely the one who stands before him, his satisfaction fulfilled. Now, here's where it comes and touches us. Grace. Bestowing to the soul grace bestowing to and within the soul God's eternal satisfaction. Man partakes of, benefits from, and grows up in the acknowledgement of it. And then we live as we grow. We live in accordance to it. See, that's the issue. There's a living in accordance to something or trying to live to deem yourself worthy of something. That's the difference. We either live in accordance as those growing in the understanding of the gift that God has given and we live daily according to it. Meaning our bodies are now living in accordance to an internal government, a spiritual government. Or we're trying to live this best life for God so that he won't be mad at us and he'll be happy. And hopefully he'll, at the end of the journey, he'll, we, he'll, he'll be happy with what we've done. And so you have people on their deathbed still wondering if they're going to get in, if they're going to make it. Shouldn't be that way. Shouldn't be questions all the time. Why? Because here's where the question's answered already. You receive something that has no question in it. You receive something that has no doubt in it. We See, that's salvation. It should be. I mean, when we talk about being delivered, saved, sa- salvation, don't, do we ever talk about that man that saved that drowning? He left his head underwater, but he saved him. No. That's how we preach salvation, though. He got us out 90% of the way, head still underwater. You better do something quick. No, it's the true gift of God is the salvation of a soul. Salvation of the soul is him gifting the soul with the one in whom he is, he is well pleased. And this is the Christocentric view that has no man central. So man, I, I have, as the recipient not the requirement. That is a terrible handwriting. I know, it's worse on paper. He is the recipient, not the requirement. That's good news. Because most people's view of salvation is we're the requirement. We've received something and we're required to keep it and make it work and Whatever, And so they twist scriptures left and right in a hundred different directions so that they can make the scripture say that. But it doesn't. In this view, we are the recipients. We are vessels of mercy. And, and we are those who had to have God do such a work for us to have anything as our own. And then we have the audacity to think. That God is foolish enough because he had to do this <laughs> for us to have anything. Now God is foolish enough to say, all right, it's up to you now. Make it work. I'll forgive you if you mess up, but make it work. I'm looking at you to get what I want. I'm looking for you to give me what I'm after. And my, just my simple point is if he doesn't have what he's after before we come to this, we're all messed up here. This is rest. You know why? Because God's already rested from his labor. That's why we call this salvation 
rest for the soul. That's the rest he offered to the Jew. That's the rest he offers to all men. Rest for your soul. Why is it? We don't have to perform because God has what he's after already. And then you have the man-centered perspective that says have the same thing and God started his plan. God begins. Right? Then it comes to us. And so we receive a portion just enough till the better comes along or just enough till we can work this process out to get more of Jesus and less of us. More of Jesus, less of us. The other thing I was going to talk about this morning was the, the phrase in John 3 where it says, He must increase, I must decrease. And the way we have mishandled that and made it a condemning verse, a way to measure ourselves among ourselves, to say, hey, is he increasing in me enough? Do you see enough of Jesus yet? Am I decreasing enough, you think? And then somebody says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they lie, and then they have to go home and repent for lying to you. That's how we've done it. And you know what? We've taken that verse so far out of its context, we've missed the context of the verse. It was John the Baptist saying that. About the coming of Jesus to take over the thing. And he says, okay, this is the whole intention of God here. I must decrease. His increase brings my decrease. Him coming on the scene means I'm no longer relevant to this picture. You see the law and the prophets being put aside in the coming of the one of whom they testified. Even the words say it. I mean, his disciples come to him and say, and this may be something we talk about later, but even his disciples come to him and say, hey, this guy that you were testifying of on the other side of the river, what's that talk about? Testifying of Christ. He's over there, he and his, they're baptizing people too, taking your ministry away from you, and all, here's the way it says, all men are coming to him. That sums it right there. Sums it all up. And what did John do? Oh, we got to stop. We got to get a better marketing plan for our ministry. No, he says, hey, man can only receive what's given to him of heaven. I was given this moment in time to be at nothing more than a t I'm not the Christ. I am not even worthy to, to touch his shoes or tie his shoe latches. I'm not worthy of that. I was here for a moment in time to testify of the greater. And now that he's on the scene, the joy of the bridegroom's friend is to hear his voice speaking to his bride. And my joy is therefore fulfilled. And we've made that beautiful thing a way to condemn ourselves. Are you incre is he increasing in you, brother? <laughs> of his fullness have we all received? I think so. I think so. Well, I don't see it. Well, stop looking where you can't see it. Look at Jesus. You're going to have to see him to see any of this true. Stop trying to bring this down to the earth where men can look at us to see it. Point them to the truth. Right? Point them to the Christ-centered salvation that does not have man as the end goal. This man-centered view places God, even though we intend it or not, it puts God's satisfaction and makes it dependent upon man's reception and his corresponding manner of life, his lifestyle, how he does things, what he does, how he handles it. That's ridiculous. God's not that foolish. 
And so man is always encouraged through preachers and books and whatever way they are to do all that is required to satisfy this God. But you know what it seems like? You never can. And that goal they set out for you keeps moving. The bullseye keeps doing this. So that hamster wheel, you just keep on going, but nothing ever happens. You can't ever attain it. But when you realize God had already attained it, and he, his gift to you is that which he has in his possession that fully pleases him, you realize there's nothing for me to do to further this along. There's only the knowing of this great gift in the seeing of the gift himself. And growing in that. And that will not give you this anxiety that all Christians seem to have where you're humped over with the burden of having to prove to God you're worthy. But you will bow down in graciousness and thanksgiving to a God who has brought to your soul that was dead and had no hope. Such a stable, anchoring, sufficient, reality is this. That's not I but Christ, right? Is this not I but Christ? That's what's preached is not I but Christ majority of the time. Because you know what's going to prove it's not I but Christ? What you do over here. That's why I've always said not I but Christ is where we start. It's not where we end. It's not the goal. It's the origin. A man-centered view keeps the standard always seeming to be out of reach. And guess what? It always is. The standard is much higher than we could ever get to. We can't ever reach that standard. It is absolutely out of our reach at all times. But does the re realization of that, does that truly give you stress and fear and anxiety of saying, so what am I going to do now to get it? Or does it show you how good this gift of grace is to not make you the one responsible for meeting the standard, but the one who by his grace gifted your soul with the standard already met? That's the difference. And I know it's funny to hear. It's not about the way we handle it, our living out of it, because that's where everybody puts the stress. But when you realize this, you will live out in accordance with something governing your soul from within. Here it's all outside trying to get in. It's from the outside in we're working this. When God's work was from the inside. And then it begins to work. Where you can say as Paul says, the life that I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Who loved me, gave himself for me. Or at one time I tried to focus and boast and have others boast in the fact that I was a circumcised Jew. The fact that I went and went to the, uh, 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 the, the, the tabernacle or the temple and did all of the offerings that I was supposed to do. And went all the rituals and things. That used to be the things I looked to and I wanted others to look at. Now, I live daily in this body. Not to try to attain anything. Not try to make anybody look at me and say, wow. I live daily looking at him and saying, wow. What a gift. What grace. How sufficient. And I don't try to make me the defining object upon which God's gaze is fixed because I know his gaze is fixed upon one and that is the one who lives in me. A man-centered view of salvation keeps an open-ended salvation before us, right? It's always open-ended. You know what that leaves? That leaves a big hole, a big opening for man to become the validating part of the picture. Men who, were, who are and remain 
fully dependent upon God to do this, now believe God is foolish enough to place his expectation upon them. I think we're putting God or placing upon God an expectation that's really our own expectation. We want to see us live it out. We want to see how good we can actually get. Preferably better than so and so. We want to see that. God doesn't have to see that. God saw one in the Holy of Holies. Just one. And in that one, he saw all. In that one, he didn't have to say, hey, how's uh, Josephine doing? Is she doing okay? Is she living it out? No. He just, upon one man. That's it. That's a Christocentric view, understanding of salvation. And guess what? Again, that's the salvation we have. This isn't even real. This is just man's concept based upon his own hope and his own self. So we put God dependent upon man to give him what he's after. So we'll say things like this. Until we're living this, it's not real. Until we're living it out, it's not effectual. I beg to differ. What brought your soul from death unto life then? That sounds pretty effectual to me. That sounds pretty real to me. So we make statements like that because we're totally ignorant. It seems like there's no fear of God in people to have those type of audacious assumptions. So this puts the finalizing emphasis upon what we do with the gift of salvation, how we handle it. And again, this leaves it open to change. There's the open-ended part of the salvation. It leaves our salvation open to change based upon what? Anything. Thought, a mistake, some little thing, little point, something somebody could point at and say, ha ha. This isn't affected by that. We could be, yes. We might be affected by it and then say, oh man, you know. But guess what? We have an advocate with the Father. That's why it is very specific to say in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sin. Out of whom is where you'd think we needed it, right? We need forgiveness of sin out here. No, it's in here where you have forgiveness of sin. Why? Because he lives in you as the one who has no sin in him. There's forgiveness of sin. Not I, but Christ. So it's not an open-ended salvation when we see it from a Christocentric view. It is closed, and it was closed here before it ever came to us. There was no open-ended part of it. It wasn't, okay, you get some of it, we'll work out the rest. See, again, twist the verses. You can make the scripture say that, but that's not what it's talking about. So we place the emphasis upon the recipient as though he, he is the requirement in the whole thing. Those whose salvation is centered in men still live under the stress of not living up to God's standard, him never being satisfied. And this is because, in their view, satisfaction of God is not something out from which salvation has been received. It is the objective upon which or unto which it is received. So we focus upon things like perfect, being perfect reflections of God, right? Being perfect reflections witnessed in to the by the world in our lifestyle, rather than just setting the full attention of our heart upon the gift. That God has given to the soul a life in which he is fully satisfied. The one perfect life in which his purpose, his intention is secured and was secured even before we came along. I've looked at this too as a many versus one distinction. A man-centered view keeps us ignorant, directs us away from the how just how unlike man he is. 
And that's the thing we do, right? We have our standard and we put our standard on God and we make earthly things and we call them spiritual and that's how we begin to judge one another. Righteousness, what does that mean? How's that look? Holy, what's that mean? How's that look? Ask a thousand people. Guess how many answers you get? And that should not be. It is not here. We do not understand how unlike us he is. How his perfection still abides unaffected without our assistance. And how it remains untainted even amid dwelling in these earthen vessels. That's real, right? It has to... The vessels of mercy... Cannot abide under such requirement, cannot measure such eternal standard, unearthly standard. So God gave a gift, knowing we would never measure up, knowing it was impossible for those who were dead in sin to ever become dead to it by their own merit. He did this. And he continues to be the source, the substantiation, the true measuring of it. And I didn't want to go long today, so I'm going to start, I'm going to end (laughs) with just this. Just this simple statement that we need to think about. And I've been thinking about it for weeks now. Either God's satisfaction is the real basis, is the basis, is the true basis out from which we receive salvation or it will be falsely assumed to be the objective for which we receive salvation. See what I'm saying? God's either satisfied at the start And we receive that satisfaction and we grow in the acknowledgement of it. Or God gives us salvation so that his goal can finally be reached and his satisfaction finally procured by us, through us, in us. It's one or the other. And I'm telling you, there's only one true answer. And it's God satisfied. And that's the basis of this gift being given. Because it's out from the riches of his Grace. Why is it riches of his grace? Because he already has the bounty and the riches of his eternal pleasure realized and fulfilled and contained in the one he gives to the soul. There's the riches and the abundance out from which he's able to give. If he had nothing, we had nothing. If he's not satisfied, he had nothing to offer the soul. That's why if 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 he's not fully satisfied before we're born again, we don't have anything to get, to receive. So, I just wanted to share that with you, with the short timing today. (laughs) But I hope at least, maybe it's ticked some of you off. I don't know. I'm used to doing that too. Just add your name to the list. Um, I just believe we as those who proclaim the gospel in this place have a responsibility and we take that responsibility seriously to present to the church the salvation that we have Don't try to make Christians feel like they're great. You're doing a good job. No. You start them off on the true basis that he did the only job required. They asked Jesus, what therefore then are the works of God? And he said, believe on the one God has sent. Believe. Why? 
because that's when you receive the work of God fully done. And we grow daily. Every moment. Our hearts are not, God, make me this, make me that, help me be, help me do, help me finally give you what you're after. No, the prayer is, God, show me the one. Show me this gift that you've given me. Unwrap that present and let me see the riches you have bestowed to me so I don't try to steal those riches in another way. I don't try to come in some other way, try to make you pleased by doing something that I believe would please you. So, I'll stop. Amen. Thanks, guys.